Hi everyone, and welcome back. In our last video lesson, we continued our discussion on Taylor polynomials by investigating the question of accuracy. Suppose I have some function f, and I want to approximate it using an nth order Taylor polynomial centered at x0. Maybe I wish to use that Taylor polynomial to approximate the value of my function at some point x nearby. In the graph, here's the point where I want to make my approximation. The question is, how good is the approximation? That is, how big is this error term, the difference between my function's value and the value of my Taylor polynomial? Now, although we didn't fully answer this question in the last lesson, we made some meaningful strides in understanding what this error term really looks like, and we've set ourselves up to answer the question today. We're going to see a result called Taylor's inequality that tells us how big this error term really is. To start things off, allow me to remind you of the major result we proved at the end of the last lesson, Taylor's remainder theorem. It states that the difference between f of x and pn x naught, our remainder term, which we denoted by rn of x, is given by this crazy integral expression involving powers of x, derivatives of f, lots of nasty stuff. It's nice that we were able to express it as a single term, but as it's written, this isn't very helpful. In particular, we can't evaluate this integral. It's just too complicated. Fortunately, however, we often don't need the exact value of the error. In many situations, an upper bound is good enough. It's helpful if we can say, okay, the Taylor polynomial and the function are no more than this far apart. So that's the goal for this lesson. We're gonna start with this nasty expression for the remainder term that we derived in the last lesson, do a little math, and come up with an upper bound for this term in absolute value. In order to estimate the absolute value of the error term, we're going to need something called the triangle inequality. Now I know what you're thinking, oh come on, I know what the triangle inequality is. It's that result that says that the absolute value of a plus b is less than or equal to the absolute value of a plus the absolute value of b. Yeah, that's correct. That's the triangle inequality classic, the most basic version of the result. However, we are going to need something a little more general. The first way that you could generalize the triangle inequality is to extend it to sums of three or more terms. Using induction, one can prove that if you have a sum of any number of terms, a1, a2, all the way up to an, then if you add them up first and then take the absolute value, that's less than or equal to what you would get if you added up their absolute values. So there you go. This result is saying that the triangle inequality extends to sums of arbitrarily many terms. In particular, we could use this triangle inequality if we ever wanted to estimate a Riemann sum, which could have lots and lots and lots of terms. If we take a limit of those Riemann sums, it might not be surprising to learn that the triangle inequality extends to integrals. This is the version of the triangle inequality that we're going to need. Since we often think of an integral sort of like a big infinite sum, our triangle inequality is gonna look just like this, but for integrals. It says that the absolute value of the integral from a to b of f of x dx is less than or equal to the integral from a to b of the absolute value of f of x dx. You can think of this version of the triangle inequality geometrically in terms of areas. Take a look at this region I have up here at the top. If you take the integral from a to b of f of x dx, you're adding up these area components. You're going to have some positive areas above the x-axis and some negative area below. That negative area might cancel out some of your positive area and ultimately reduce the value of your integral. If instead, though, you compute the expression on the right, well, you take the absolute value of the function first. So this negative area would flip up and become positive. When you take the integral and add up these areas, you don't get any cancellation. This expression is the bigger one. Okay, back to the problem at hand. We have a function f that we'd like to approximate at some value x. So we do this by finding the nth order Taylor polynomial at a nearby point x0. The question is, how big is this error term, the gap between the two curves? The magnitude of that error is given by the absolute value of this nasty integral. And while we can't calculate it exactly, we'd like to find an upper bound for its value. To do this, we'll use our triangle inequality. It says that this expression is less than or equal to the integral from x0 to x of the absolute value of our integrand. Now I can split up my absolute value over the terms in this product, and so that's what I'll do. I'll write the integrand as the absolute value of x minus t, all to the power of n, divided by n factorial, 
times the absolute value of the n plus first derivative dt. Notice that we still can't really evaluate this integral because we don't know anything about this last term, the magnitude of our n plus first derivative of f. In practice, though, you will know what the function f is, and you'll be able to calculate its n plus first derivative. If you find that in magnitude it's bounded by some constant k, then you could replace this expression with k in your integral. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to assume that we know the function f, and we've managed to show that its n plus first derivative at t is bounded above an absolute value by a constant k. We're going to need this to be true over the entire domain of integration for values of t from x0 to x. You'll see how to pick this constant k in some of our example videos. The next term that we're going to have to worry about is this absolute value of x minus t to the n. Notice that if x, the point where we're making the approximation, occurs to the right of x0, then x minus t is going to be positive for all values of t in this range, and we can remove this absolute value. If instead x occurs on the left of x0, then x minus t will be negative, and the absolute value will multiply this expression by minus 1. These two cases are both very similar, so I'm going to assume that x occurs to the right of x0. I'm going to assume that x0 is less than or equal to x. So in this case, my integral is less than or equal to k times the integral from x0 to x of x minus t to the n over n factorial dt. And would you look at this? This is an integral that we can actually evaluate. Making the substitution u equals x minus t and changing the bounds accordingly, we can rewrite this as minus k integral from x minus x0 to 0 of u to the n over n factorial du. Well, at this point, the integral is quite easy. We increase the power of u by 1 and divide by n plus 1. That'll give us an n plus 1 factorial on the bottom. When you sub in your bounds, you should be left with k times x minus x0 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. And there you go. We have an upper bound for the error in our approximation. Notice that it depends on k, the magnitude of the n plus first derivative of f, as well as x minus x0, which is really the distance between these two points. The farther away x is from the center of the approximation, the bigger this term will be. And maybe that makes sense. I'll leave it as an exercise, but you get a very similar expression in the case when x is less than or equal to x0. When you combine these two expressions, you get what we know as Taylor's inequality. All right, here it is, folks, the result we've been building toward for the last couple lessons, Taylor's inequality. It states that if you want to approximate the value of your function f at some point x, and you want to do so using the nth order Taylor polynomial centered at x0, then the magnitude of the error in that approximation is no more than k times the absolute value of x minus x0 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. Here, k is exactly as it was on the previous slide. It's an upper bound for the absolute value of our n plus first derivative at points between x0 and x. To see how we can use this result in practice, check out my example video to follow.